Good evening, dear friends. I'm Homi Bhava. I chair the, the uh, Mahindra Humanities Center. And it's a really a great pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for taking time uh, to come and see us at a very busy time of the year. I can think I can think of no more fitting and way to end the first year of our Mellon seminar on violence, nonviolence, than with this evening's discussion of Walt Whitman's drum taps. We've approached this year's theme of war from the widest possible range of disciplines, history, anthropology, political theory, urban studies, law, and literature, to name a few. But always with the arts and humanities, in the front of our minds. Our February conference on World War I, The Great War at 100, was as attentive to the poetry, painting, and music associated with the Great War as it was concerned with the war's geopolitical dimensions. Each panel was interleaved with performances based on the writings of Remarque, Vera Britton, Dos Passos, Siegfried Sassoon, Wilfred Owen, and several others. In March, we invited Matt O'Coin and Devon Tynes for a discussion and a small concert performance of Crossing, an opera based on the Civil War diaries and poems of Walt Whitman. Crossings will be premiere at the ART at the end of May. Our Mellon seminar on violence, nonviolence, is an engagement with ideas, concepts, and contexts. For us, however, every event is embedded in the cultural, aesthetic, and ethical narratives that are at the heart of the arts and humanities. Tonight's speakers and musicians will explore the complex compassion of Whitman's Civil War poetry, his irresistible desire to be a part of the war, his care for maimed and dying soldiers amidst unprecedented mass death, his concerns for the individuality of those soldiers, even as he revels in and claims to speak for the collective, the union, the nation. Whitman makes vivid the profound importance of imagining conditions other than violence, the singularity of love, the care for the person suffering alone, even as he finds himself in the midst of violence, pillage, and the tragic clash of collective forces. Here is the Whitman of the broad and distant perspective who loves parades with their powerful throbs with the beating of drums, the endless and noisy chorus, the rustle and clank of muskets, even the sight of the wounded, the dense brigade bound for the war with high piled military wagons following, people endless streaming with strong voices, passions, pageants. And here is the intimate Whitman who keeps vigil strange on the field one night for a single beloved soldier. My comrade, I wrapped in his blanket, enveloped well his form, folded the blanket well, tucking it carefully overhead and carefully under feet. And there and then, and bathed by the rising sun, my son in his grave, in his rude, dug grave I deposited, ending my vigil strange with that vigil of night and battlefield dim, vigil for boy of responding kisses, never again on earth responding. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to mark the republication of the original 1865 edition drum taps for the first time in 150 years with its editor, Lawrence Kramer, and with my colleagues, Lawrence Buell and Elisa New. The event was brought to us by Louis Menand, by Luke Menand, and I thank you, Luke, for doing this and for bringing us so many good ideas over the years you've been associated with the center. I will briefly introduce each of our speakers in turn, <clears throat> and then our musicians, and once we have, uh, our speakers have had their say and the musicians have had their play, we will then turn to a discussion. Lawrence Kramer is a composer, musicologist, and distinguished professor at Fordham University. 
In addition to the New York Review edition of Drum Taps, his books include Expression and Truth on the Music of Knowledge. Lawrence Buell is Powell M. Cabot Research Professor of American Literature at Harvard. His most recent book is The Dream of the Great American Novel. Lisa New is Powell M. Cabot Professor of American Literature at Harvard. Her books include The Lion's Eye, Poetic Experience, American Sight. Heinrich Christiansen is music director at King's Chapel, Boston. He's an avid proponent of contemporary music and has performed and recorded extensively as both a soloist and with choral groups. And Eric Perry is a tenor, conductor, and composer who has performed across the United States as well as in Canada, Germany, Iceland, and Australia. In the 2014-15 season, he has appeared in concerts with the Handel and Haydn Society, Boston's Cantata Singers, and with the nationally acclaimed Santa Fe Desert Chorale. Our musicians will join us later, but now I turn to our panelists, and I thank you very much for being here this evening, and I thank you all for joining us. Thank you. And you can start right now. Um, would you prefer to? Neither is fine with me. Set to go up, go. Okay, all right. So um, we have worked out the order of presentation. <laughs> I guess I start. Um, and first of all, um, I would uh, like to thank uh, everyone at the Mahindra Center for uh, hosting me, inviting me to take part in this discussion. I'm very pleased uh, to be here, and uh, I will get right to it, I suppose, by drawing attention. Many of you have seen uh, the book. I think there are some outside. Um, I'm going to talk about the color of this edition of Drum Taps. Um, I talked with the editors of the New York Review quite a bit about what went in to the book, but I never said a word to them about the outside of the book. And when it was delivered uh, to my house in a box, you know, which I couldn't open, um, I, I pulled the uh, box apart, and there it was. It was green. And I thought to myself, well, what else would it be? It's Walt Whitman, right? Leaves of grass, right? It's got to be green. And Fine, except this isn't leaves of grass. It's drum taps. And it's OK with me it's that it's green. It's a, it's a kind of a nice green. I like it. But the thing that that all brought to mind is that when Whitman wrote drum taps, he was very firmly committed to the idea that it was not going to be a part of leaves of grass. And he changed his mind about that in the middle 1860s. And the reason that we haven't actually been able to read drum taps, uh, unless we're scholars working our way through variorum editions for 150 years, is that Whitman decided that was going to be a part of Leaves of Grass after all. In fact, in 1867, uh, working on the fourth edition of Leaves of Grass, he literally had unbound copies of drum taps sewn in to the copies of Leaves of Grass. So there are two big questions about drum taps. The first question is why it was put together in the peculiar way it was. And the second question is why Whitman, having put it together, decided to take it apart. And I'll spend uh, my time trying to shed some light on those uh, questions. Uh, from the very first, Whitman and Whitman's friends insisted that drum taps came about as a direct result of Whitman's work as a volunteer at uh, hospitals and field hospitals in and around Washington, D.C. during the Civil War. He uh, started uh, to do so uh, in uh, very late um, 1862, going into 63. Um, he had gone to the battlefield at uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, or actually the, the place, Falmouth, Virginia, where the Union troops had retreated after this devastating uh, Union defeat at Fredericksburg, uh, looking for his brother, who had been reported wounded in the battle. And he was so moved by the sight of the uh, suffering that he saw there, the hospital, that he more or less decided on the spot that he was going to spend uh, his time helping, uh, nursing, doing whatever he could to alleviate the pain. 
And one of the things that, of course, it would occur to him as Walt Whitman, the poet, to do is not only you know, at a practical level to go out there and help read, give candies and fruits and hugs and kisses to the wounded and dying soldiers, but also to bear witness to their suffering. And that latter motive, the idea of bearing witness, of letting the world see through his poetry what he saw, was the immediate motive for the composition of this book. Now, I think that to get an idea um, of what Whitman <clears throat> was responding to, it would be helpful to have an image before us. Most images of Civil War hospitals are highly sanitized. They show neat rooms. They saw, show clean people in neat poses. Um, it, it wasn't like that. The conditions in most Civil War hospitals, particularly the first two or three years of the war, were positively appalling. So if we can have uh, the uh, image of the hospital at Savage Station on the, um, on the screen. Uh, this is actually a stereotype image. And it, it's, I reproduced both sides of it because this is the clearest you can get it. This gives you some f idea of the chaos and misery that uh, was present in these battlefield sites. So this, this is what Whitman wanted to, to bear witness to, to bear testimony to in, in drum taps. And he had a very particular concept of how he would go about that. There were two dimensions to it. One was placing this suffering in its relevant contexts. And the other was approximating in poetry the kind of vivid detail that was, had recently become available through photography. Whitman repeatedly referred to what happens in drum taps mm -hmm. as scenes and pictures. Uh, at one point, uh, Whitman's friend John Burroughs, writing at Whitman's dictation, referred to uh, the scenes in the most, one of the most vivid of the hospital poems, the dresser, later called the wound dresser, as daguerreotypes <clears throat> of Whitman's experience. And Whitman was very absorbed with photography. Uh, he was a habitué of Matthew Brady's studio in New York. He knew Brady, was photographed by Brady. Uh, even more importantly, he was a friend of Alexander Gardner, who began his career as a Brady photographer, but in 1863 opened his own studio in Washington, where Whitman was living and working. Whitman and uh, Gardner became friends. Gardner took Whitman's photograph at his studio several times in 1863. Uh, one of the pictures is reproduced on the back cover of the book. Whitman said it was his favorite of all of the photos ever taken of him until Thomas Aikens got to him in old age. Uh, and uh, the idea of creating in language the kind of vivid, accurate rendering uh, of the war that had become possible in photographs, I think, was a, a principal motive for Whitman. And in fact, I think that I have made a kind of minor discovery about this, which I'm going to try to unveil to you in the next uh, minute. Um, one of the most famous of the poems in uh, Drum Taps is called Cavalry Crossing a Ford. And <clears throat> the uh, poem contains the line, behold the brown-faced men, each group, each person, a picture. And Whitman describes this line of cavalry crossing this, this ford uh, in a serpentine course, long line of troops on their horses. And I found um, a picture which may, I mean, I can't possibly prove this, but the overlap is really quite striking, taken by Timothy O'Sullivan, who was a, a first also a Brady photographer, but he moved with Gardner when Gardner moved. And many of the most famous photographs that Gardner published were actually taken by O'Sullivan. If we can have cavalry crossing a ford. This is an image by Gardner. It's a, about as close a visual realization of what Whitman describes in the poem, right down to the serpentine look um, of the pattern that is being followed by these troops, as one could possibly imagine. So um, I think that uh, we're looking here at uh, a, an attempt by Whitman to 
you know, match the documentary power of photographs and to impress on his readers the force of the things he witnessed uh, with the same kind of force that the photographs uh, had on people. And it should be mentioned uh, that the Civil War, the American Civil War, was the first war of which there is an extensive photographic record. There are a, a few photographs from the Crimean War a decade earlier, but the, the Civil War was host to an extensive photographic archive. Okay, the other thing that Whitman wanted to, uh, to accomplish in the drum taps was to uh, trace a movement from fervid, passionate war fever, full of martial fury and a desire for conquest and victory at all costs, to a chastened understanding that the cost of achieving that victory was immeasurable. And all versions of drum taps, the reduced version that Whitman uh, put into Leaves of Grass eventually, um, the first version, which he sort of published in April 1865, the second version, which he published in October of 1865, they all trace that same arc. They all begin with fury, and they all end in uh, heartbroken compassion. And that arc is the, uh, the fundamental underlying rhythm of drum taps. Now, the story, it gets complicated, and I, I won't say more about it right now because I, I'm worried about eating up too much time. So I'll just tell you one more thing and then uh, we'll pass along to my colleagues. Whitman was working feverishly in April of 1865 to get drum taps published. Uh, and it's really notable that uh, he was intent upon doing this before the war had actually ended. And I think that the reason for that was that his sense of urgency uh, in communicating uh, his vision of the suffering of the soldiers, both North and South, weighed on his mind at that particular moment more than the outcome of the war did. In any case, by early 1865, it was already clear that the war would end soon in a Union victory. And Whitman simply moved on ahead. And then events caught up with him in the most extraordinary of, of ways. Uh, the book is in press. Um, everything is moving forward. And then Robert E. Lee surrenders to Ulysses S. Grant at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. And suddenly, the war de facto is over. I mean, it wasn't over de jure until much later, but everybody knew that was the end. And the ripple effect of that, the repercussions of, uh, of that were enormous. And then five days later, they became much more enormous. April 14th, 1865, John Wilk Wilkes Booth shoots Abraham Lincoln at Ford's Theater. April 15th, in the morning, Lincoln dies. The book simply could not go on and not respond to these events. It wasn't an overnight decision. Whitman actually had a, uh, a few copies made. He had about 100 uh, unbound copies which he had contracted for. And some of those were bound into a book which was put into limited distribution. Uh, they're very rare, hard to get hold of these copies. Uh, but Whitman uh, held everything else back. He, he knew that this publication was inadequate. And it took him six months to get the book to the position where he needed it and wanted it to be. Um, had this thing called the sequel to Drum Taps uh, printed, and then he had uh, them, uh, the, the sequel sewn in together with the uh, bound and unbound copies of the earlier Drum Taps to produce this book. And the pivot, the critical thing, um, in between these two stages of development was the construction of an elegy for Abraham Lincoln which would be worthy of the event that it was addressing. Uh, in the early version, and it's still here, Whitman didn't remove it, there's a, a little poem called Hush Be the Camps Today, which he wrote hurriedly after Lincoln's assassination and sent to the printer on April 21st. Uh, <clears throat> But he knew that he had to write uh, something that was graver and longer and of a magnitude to respond to the event. And so the second portion of Drum Taps, after the, after the uh, sequel is inserted, 
becomes something different than the photographic drum taps that I described at, at the beginning. From photography as a model, from uh, accurate documentary bearing witness as a model, we move to the mode of elegy and mourning, of the construction of symbols, of the transformation of events into meanings. And in this uh, second portion of Drum Taps, the sequel, since the preceding came from the press, as Whitman put it, there is a constant move into the elegiac mode. So that the whole temporal structure changes and the, the project now becomes mourning the dead of the war, exemplified by Lincoln, but then it gradually expanding to include all soldiers, both North and South. And in that act of mourning, finding the necessary and uh, adequate symbolic means of coming to terms with the historical events that had just transpired. So you, you move from documentation to symbolization. And when you put those two together, that you get the whole of Drum Taps, which was what I'd hoped to recover by editing this book. Uh, Whitman chose to abandon the difference uh, that he had created. I'll just take, sorry to, to do this. There's one more second. The second poem in, in Drum Taps, Shut Not Your Doors to Me, Proud Libraries. Whitman wrote um, that this particular book for soldiers um, is a book separate, not linked with the rest. And in 1867, he undid that and linked it with the rest. Uh, I've spoken long enough. I uh, want to hear what my colleagues have to say. We don't really know why, but he did it. It was his fault. We're correcting him. <laughs> I'll be venturing some reflections on uh, this very question of um, the pros and cons of undoing. Not that I can uh, pull Walt back from uh, wherever he is and get him to testify directly. Uh, so my remarks will fall into three unequal parts, uh, which might be called ancient error, adolescent confusion line, and seasoned wisdom, in quotation marks. So here it goes. Um, Drum Taps, uh, including the sequel, was one of several dozen uh, books, pamphlet size, mostly, of poetry about Civil War, written north and south. Some anthologies, um, the majority single authored. Uh, most are lost uh, except to extreme specialists, and it's just as well. Uh, Melville's and Whitman's are the two that survive, and Whitman's uh, is the one of the two that has the benefit of uh, personal experience behind it, and personal witness. Um, it was not greeted with huge enthusiasm by the American press, uh, and under the heading of ancient era, I'll start with a little quotation uh, uh, with which Henry James's review of Drum Taps opens. James writes, it has been a melancholy task to read this book, and it is a still more melancholy one to write about. It exhibits the effort of an essentially prosaic mind to lift itself by a prolonged muscular strain into poetry. Like hundreds of other good patriots during the last four years, Mr. Whitman has imagined that a certain amount of violent sympathy with the great deeds and sufferings of our soldiers and of admiration for our national energy, together with a ready command of picturesque language, are sufficient inspiration for a poet. If this were the case, we had been a nation of poets. And it goes on from there, basically downhill. Happily, James later saw the error of his ways, and uh, according to Edith Wharton, uh, in his latter years, uh, he relished uh, reading uh, James aloud to his friends uh, in his uh, salon, um, and admiringly too, but it took him a while to wake up from uh, the uh, narrow conception of what poetry should be, rightly understood. He was still 
himself too much, I guess, the prisoner of the metronome and his understanding of how uh, poetry uh, should parse. Uh, the adolescent confusion part, a little bit about the Bullian lifeline. Um, as an undergraduate, uh, I was conversant only with the so-called deathbed edition, the charming short form description of the final edition of Leaves of Grass. And it really has traction because Whitman did pretty much on his deathbed say, this is how I want my poems to be arranged. Um, and I could remember my utter astonishment when I came across his retrospective essay, uh, written a little bit before uh, his death, well, self-evidently, um, in which he says this about the Civil War moment. Uh, Although I had made a start before, only from the occurrence of the secession war and what it showed me as if by flashes of lightning with the emotional depths it sounded and aroused, only from the strong flare and provocation of that war's sights and scenes, the final reasons for being of an autochthonous and passionate song definitely came forth. Uh, in other words, the war, dear reader, is the anchor point of the argument of my deathbed edition, my final version of Leaves of Grass. Um, well, it's that uh, view of the case that uh, Lawrence Kramer, uh, in his edition and in his introduction, is um, eager to undo or uh, call attention to the uh, simplification of. And I have a great deal of sympathy for that uh, revisionist perspective, uh, even if not 100%. Um, another uh, juvenescent experience that will uh, eventually get me out of autobiography into more substantive stuff um, was, uh, as a first year graduate student, uh, the revelations that came upon me uh, reading, uh, as we all did in that uh, seminar, uh, Whitman stage by stage, edition by edition. Uh, and uh, this helped to put into perspective my initial feeling of astonishment at that assertion in backward glance because I knew this much. I knew that there already had been three editions of Leaves of Grass uh, before drum taps uh, and the Civil War moment ever came into being for Whitman. And, uh, that the 1860 edition, the third edition of Leaves of Grass, uh, had uh, 365 poems in it, the same number of days in a year, um, by no accident. And so it was a pretty um, uh, accomplished uh, level that he had reached before uh, even drum taps began. Well, if you read Whitman in sequence, uh, you get uh, uh, a deeper sense of this uh, and it both increases the paradox. How could he possibly have uh, said what he did in uh, that late essay? Uh, and the confusion about uh, uh, how he could have course corrected uh, not once but twice. Uh, first, as uh, Professor Kramer has said in uh, claiming drum taps to be uh, a freestanding different intervention. Leaves of grass is done, uh, drum taps is something else again. This is to be uh, a book uh, focused centrally on the war, but more broadly, uh, as he put it in a resonant phrase to a friend that uh, Professor Kramer quotes in his introduction, uh, about this time and land we swim in, um, a kind of a snapshot of the American 1860s. Um, drum taps happen to be not the only attempt that Whitman ever made to cut loose from Leaves of Grass and do something different. Uh, but the first of these, and uh, uh, the most successful, hands down, I won't mention the others. Um, and um, I still treasure 
uh, the copy that I worked with as a graduate student, which is the other modern edition of drum taps. You can't get it anymore, it's out of print. Scholars, facsimiles, and reprints. And I wave it because of the color, it's brown. And this was the color of drum taps uh, when it was put between covers in the 1860s. And I think probably the muted brown was, it was a trade decision that wasn't particular to the war uh, motif, but it very much fits uh, what uh, the uh, tenor of the volume delivers. Okay, now part three, which is what? Uh, seasoned wisdom in quotation marks. Uh, I'm going to make uh, first uh, the case for drum taps as a freestanding collection in brief as I see it. And then um, also on the opposite side, some reflections about how it also makes a kind of sense, at least looking at the result, not being able to go back and uh, reconstruct the intent, why it should have been reassorbed into uh, leaves of grass uh, and uh, the deathbed edition as we now have it. Uh, there are at least five reasons why drum taps works uh, and deserves uh, always to be available uh, for readership today uh, as a freestanding volume. One is the uh, integral structure and sequential flow of it. Uh, and this is something I'm just going to assert. And you'll have to accept the argument from authority because time presses, uh, except uh, only to say that uh, one powerful trajectory is the deconversion experience that it uh, delivers from uh, initial uh, jingoistic warmongering to uh, the uh, much more somber and complex and also compassionate uh, state that Whitman gets into uh, after he uh, takes on his role as male nurse uh, in the uh, early 1860s, about uh, a third of the way through the war. The, the, the volume as a freestanding collection is also important as a rollout of a, a new poetic voice for Whitman, less brag, more humility. Uh, and concomitantly, number three, uh, a shift in the persona figure uh, from uh, a kind of uh, demiurgic, um, uh, cosmic, all-seeing voice uh, to uh, a less assertive and more embodied uh, and more elderly figure, um, embodied especially in uh, the role that he was proudest of, of ministering to the wounded in the hospitals uh, in the war. Uh, the poem that was originally called The Dresser, eventually retitled The Wound Dresser, uh, captures this especially, Whitman in his role as male nurse. It also happens to be uh, one of the first uh, pieces of literature that without 100% self-consciously realizing it, uh, deals frontally with post-traumatic stress syndrome. In this case, his own. Uh, it's written from the standpoint of an even older person uh, who can't shake the dream of what he's, he's done um, in the war theater. Um, this role that Whitman played, um, it has a very poignant resonance against the background of his entire lifeline. He always wanted, uh, to be a poet healer of some sort. Uh, he wanted uh, in a, per a very deeply interpersonal sense as well as in a social sense, not just to be a prophet, uh, but to be uh, a person with a healing touch. And I mean that in a literal sense as well as a metaphorical sense. And uh, fortuitously, one might say almost miraculously, in the role of ministering to 
uh, the Union wounded, uh, and in some cases the Confederate wounded too. Uh, Whitman um, uh, uh, became the figure of his imagination that previously was more of a free-floating fantasy, uh, fitfully acted out, and I won't go into the fitfully acted out part. Um, the great uh, biographer of Whitman, Roger Asselineau, um, who uh, came to that project after having um, been in the, the trenches or beneath the trenches in the basements of the French resistance uh, in World War II, makes this point uh, very eloquently, and I think uh, from the heart, from his own experience. Um, so this comes out, uh, this personalization of his investment in his role in the war in lots of different ways, uh, including in the most famous poem, When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloom, which is remarkable, if not unique, uh, as one of the uh, immortal pastoral elegies of all time, but uh, the one uh, in which the public figure is figured as if he were an intimate friend, uh, a loved one. That, that's really quite uh, a remarkable move for the poem to have made. Um, but no less substantively, in a bunch of the other poems, I'm going to uh, mention only one, um, one called uh, Come Up From the Fields, Father, um, in which uh, the imagined scene is uh, a place in Ohio, a farming family where a letter comes and um, the, uh, somebody in the family uh, cries out, come up from the fields, father. Here's a letter from our Pete. And come up for the, to the front door, mother. Here's a letter from thy dear son. And as it goes on, uh, of course, the letter says that uh, the young man is wounded, uh, will soon be better, except we know that he's not. In fact, uh, he's dead even then, and uh, the mother later pines and dies. It's very poignant. It's a little sentimental, a little kitschy, but uh, Every time I read it, uh, particularly if I read it aloud, uh, it's hard for me to fight back tears. Uh, and it's all the more resonant because who wrote the letter? Walt, almost surely. So that piece of uh, ventriloquism amidst the plangency and the poignancy is really, really very striking. Uh, through this, uh, Whitman, took what previously he had asserted um, in a much different register uh, about a manly comradeship as the glue that binds uh, at least the homosocial part of a republic together, and he made it concrete and intimate. Um, and also uh, in the process, uh, without uh, fully knowing how he did it, probably helped to ensure his fame and his embracement as uh, the American bard. That poem I just quoted from, Come Up From the Field's Father, uh, he got fan mail about. He got fan mail from teenagers, a couple of teenage girls uh, who had done it as performance pieces uh, at uh, Memorial Day, it used to be called Decoration Day, uh, festivities uh, wrote him with great uh, affection and about the, um, success with which their performance piece was uh, received. Uh, it's just a nifty example of Whitman being uh, embraced without quite realizing who was gonna be embracing him. Um, in addition to the things that I've said already, and then I'm gonna flip the uh, coin, uh, a case for freestanding collection can be made on the basis of how the uh, the war, he elasticizes beyond the war material um, in poems later dispersed to other parts of Leaves of Grass. Uh, just one example would be the poem called Pioneers, a somewhat uh, clunky westward expansionist poem, but very important for that historical moment because it's the Lincoln uh, regime, the Republican Revolution, as it's been called, that is ensuring the a burst of westward expansion, including Immigration, Homestead Act, 
uh, the population of the hinterlands. Uh, so oh, pioneers belongs at this historical moment, even though it doesn't have anything to do with the war per se. Uh, it has to do with uh, the uh, Republican hegemony that's, that's uh, uh, there in the background. So now why did he bring it back uh, and disperse some of the poems and just make drum caps uh, a part of the um, larger ensemble? I don't know why. Uh, I have to be agnostic, just as Professor Kramer does. Uh, but <clears throat> uh, these are some reflections, and I'll try to make them shorter than my previous ones. Drum Taps becomes the pivotal central section of the final Leaves of Grass. Um, so everything before it, in a way, uh, tends to radiate uh, early optimism uh, and energy. Uh, it tends to be disproportionately loaded with poems that he wrote in the first three editions of Lisa Grass before the war. And everything after it tends to be disproportionately autumnal in a personal sense. You, you have a sense of the uh, energies of the persona uh, diminishing and uh, him aging. But you also have a sense of a dissemination uh, of the nation as it expands, uh, bread greater uh, of the canvas of um, the geography of the U.S. and beyond uh, the U.S. Uh, so that in the long run, uh, the war is a nodal point, uh, a crisis point uh, that uh, interfuses with the autobiographical dimension of the final lease of grass uh, in a way that at least tries to make good, and I think it largely makes good on uh, his programmatic statements that uh, his uh, agenda for Lisa Grass was uh, to put uh, uh, the experience, the inner experience of a self, a representative self uh, on paper in the context of the history of uh, the times of his nation in that century. Um, drum taps, too, I think could be regarded fairly as more an evolution than a total break from what came before it. Uh, the experimentation in short imagistic genres like Cavalry Crossing a Ford, the poem that uh, is connected with the Gardner photograph, I didn't know that, this is a revelation for me. Uh, he's experimenting in that uh, before uh, drum saps, uh, and uh, I could say other things about uh, how uh, it's evolution by degrees, uh, and that helps make the folding back of drum taps uh, into the big collection understandable, but I go on from there. When he does it, uh, by eliminating uh, the non-war poems largely, it adds to the concentrated intensity on war matters uh, in the drum tap section of the larger leaves of grass itself. And to me, that's striking. I think it becomes a tighter um, node than uh, the book uh, originally was as a freestanding collection. So you can say there's a plus to that, there's a minus to that. In the tighter node uh, as revised, that poem, The Dresser, The Wound Dresser, which is where he rolls out most directly uh, his mission as a male nurse, it becomes the center point of drum taps as it isn't uh, quite, uh, at least not, uh, a numerical center of gravity in the original volume. Uh, then I could speak also, uh, and I'll confine myself to one single example, of how when he disperses some of the original drum tap spawns um, to other parts of the collection, lots of interesting and inventive things happen. Uh, Professor Kramer uh, mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned at any rate, uh, shot not, no, you didn't, or did you? Well, anyway, <laughs> shut not your doors on me, proud libraries. Yes, uh, which is item number two in drum taps. Uh, it works very well as item number two in drum taps. He's almost like saying, Henry James, don't write that review. Think twice before you diss me. Uh, but where he put it eventually was in uh, a series of prefatory poems, uh, warm-up poems called inscriptions, and it works perfectly well there too. So uh, 
For me, it's a both and. It's a sort of twofer. It's very good where it is, and it's good where it became. Um, and I could go on with that. The last thing I'll say, and this is maybe a sort of uh, anticipatory uh, thing having to do with musicality, I think it's super fitting that Drum Taps has been brought back from the grave, the grave into which my treasured graduate school edition fell, by a person who is equally expert and uh, attached to literature and music. Uh, because if there ever was a volume that has musicality in it, in many different ways, it's this. Uh, there are instruments, drums, brass, organs. Um, there are uh, many other uh, sound makers, music makers, most famously the uh, thrush, uh, the singer, the secret singer in Lilacs. Uh, and then there are non-obvious ways too. And I'll mention only one non-obvious way. I know it's coming up uh, as part of a later stage of this, uh, but I can't forbear and it's very short. Uh, it's the poem called Look Down Fair Moon, uh, which beholds uh, corpses on a battlefield. And it goes like this, just four lines. Look down fair moon and bathe this scene. Pour softly down night's nimbus floods on faces ghastly swollen purple. On the dead, on their backs, with their arms tossed wide. Pour down your unstinted nimbus, sacred moon. Pour down your unstinted nimbus, sacred moon. Um, Emerson once wrote, um, even the corpse has its own beauty. Uh, you could read this poem, though, silently, and it would be an ocular poem, just as the Emerson uh, aphorism is ocular. But read aloud, it's a sonic poem. All the long A's and long O's, um, it adds, it adds, it means something to add voice uh, to the text in this case. It means a whole lot. Um, so with that, I end. I've added voice to text. My, um, my reflections will be more brief. Um, I'll just speak for a few minutes and then I will show some video. Um, but first, I really would like to thank Lawrence Kramer for this, uh, for this new edition, which um, is, as all new editions are, an opportunity for readers familiar with a text to see it in a new way. For me, just the spaciousness, the restoration of a lot of white space um, brought these individual lyrics and the, um, the feeling and effort that went into shaping them as separate, uh, as, as separate performances. Um, uh, this edition brought that, um, brought that into focus so that for readers familiar with um, with a text uh, like Drum Taps. Uh, the, the text is renewed and of course there will be reviews and, uh, and uh, there is therefore an opportunity for, for new readers. And Whitman certainly wanted, uh, as he said, to be as absorbed and affectionately embraced, not only in his own time, uh, but, uh, but in ours, and that, uh, that enabling that inf affectionate embrace of poets has become uh, part of my work that I'll, I'll share in a minute. Um, first, though, I did want to say, you know, by way of selling some books for Lawrence, uh, uh, some of, uh, just offer some reflections on, uh, on how the new issue of a volume can bring into focus, can pick out like gold thread, can bring and raise into a kind of italic script themes uh, we'd seen before. And uh, I guess I'm thinking like a modernist, right? <laughs> there's there's something about how you've how you've made it made it new here. 
Um, and so a few observations about what this, this new edition brings into focus for me and what indeed you've synthesized in a very, very beautiful uh, introduction. First, um, what becomes so powerful, and I agree with my colleague uh, Larry Buell, what becomes so powerful in the reading of this text um, is, is the emancipation of feeling, of affect, and of whole ranges of feeling that are not permissible in peacetime, um, that do not fit within the hours of the workday, that, um, that are interrupted by the division between late, the, the laboring day and the domestic hearth. And there is a, there is a, a bleeding through. I actually didn't mean that bleeding in that way. But there is, a, there is a way in which a new transfusive kind of affective and emotional energy is released by war, and I think that one of the things Whitman does, even in the early poems of drum taps um, that do read very jingoistically, and uh, they're, they're bellicose and they seem, let's go to war. Um, but I think Whitman is interested in, um, in why we go to war. What is, right? There must be a reason <laughs> that human beings commit themselves to these long, um, uh, to these long slogs of, into slaughter and despair. Why do they do it? And I think that he shows us is one of the reasons they do it is to be released into a fuller, more operatic kind of emotional register and to, and to live that way. Uh, and so uh, I told, I told Larry before, uh, before we were speaking that his phrase, um, eroticized compassion, <laughs> he uses the phrase eroticized compassion for a particular kind of tender physical relationship between men that would never have been possible in civilian life where uh, where the relationship of a nurse to a soldier can draw in a whole set of other relationships. In one night, in one day, one can be the mother of the soldier, the father of the soldier, the brother of the soldier, Christ to the soldier. He can be Christ to you. And as Larry points out in this, uh, in this very beautiful introduction, the restoration of this poem, Mother and Babe, right next to the, the much more well-known Vigil Strange uh, I spent, had in the field one night. I kept in the field I kept, one night. sorry, I knew I had the verb wrong. Vigil Strange, I kept. That mother and babe tells us this is a pieta, right? Tells us that Whitman um, is, the, uh, is, is the mother of this, uh, of this Christ child. And so there's a very beautiful way in which the effective register, the range of human feeling just breaks open uh, in this book. And I hear the emotional resonance of that more. So I think I'm on, I think so far, I thought I wasn't gonna pick a side in this, but <laughs> as I'm going. Um, I, I also want, and really I'm just stealing here, I also want to, uh, to say how I noticed in reading, yes, this introduction and also the book, um, I noticed my own, I brought into um, consciousness in a fuller way, um, the polyphony, right? Whitman and Larry said this as well, that Whitman, you know, that, that guy who beats his chest and says, I celebrate myself and sing myself and is stuck uh, in, in, for better or worse inside his gigantic, capacious, um, generous voice um, is, gets, gets away. It goes, goes AWOL uh, from his own voice and more like Melville than I would have expected, 
the Melville who says that his battle pieces is just a harp that he puts in the window uh, that, you know, that picks up the, um, the, the passing movement, the winds, the sounds of, uh, of the war. That polyphony in, uh, in drum taps really um, is, is for me more audible in this. And one hears him to, to um, refer to the poem, Come Up From the Fields, Father, I did not know about girls singing it on, um, uh, on Memorial Day. But certainly one can hear in that poem the lacrimose tinkling of wartime sentimental songs and um, to listen to that, and of course this is such a musical book, to listen to that, uh, to that poem um, next to those, uh, those um, finding a, the consensual or the conscripted <laughs> rhythm of the parade ground. Um, and uh, to hear in this book that uh, all of those musics, uh, those musics that organize us and those musics that um, uh, um, uh, standardize us. <laughs> the, uh, and the, the, you know, the, the, the drive and desire uh, people sorrowing um, uh, a nation at war has towards standard forms of expression that, you know, you think of those yellow ribbons that we were all putting on our cars during uh, the, the Iran-Iraq war, or even the way in every airport, um, quite properly, the airline attend, the person selling the ticket will say, thank you for your service, or, right, that, that in wartime we seek convention uh, and that convention, uh, and I, uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I enjoyed in this volume that um, Whitman, allow and Whitman allowing himself, as you point out, formal uh, verse, allowing himself, Captain, my Captain, looking for a stately, um, uh, a stately national, music and I the the book is so full so gusty <laughs> right so full of uh, of striving and effort and sometimes quite clunky um, uh, in its uh, in its striving um, but so second reason I like this volume polyphony the documentary um, I've I'm I did um, agree that that was a serpentine in Cavalry Crossing a Ford. Cavalry Crossing a Ford is, however, so colorful. I know that we only had black and white photography, uh, but the, just looking at that, uh, at that image you showed made me think even further than I had in preparing these remarks about what kind of journalist, what kind of documentarian Whitman was learning to be. This was the guy who had been, you know, just a hack reporter. Uh, he'd write for anybody. He'd, you know, he'd write for the theater tickets. He'd, uh, he'd sometimes just recite the party line. Uh, and he, in his, in his earlier years, and certainly Leaves of Grass gains so much from this, he's on the city beat. You know, he's looking at the corpses. He's reporting on the fires, and he's a, he's a very quotidian, he's a, thank you, that was well done. Uh, he's, a, he's a reporter of the, of quotidian events. Um, yes, he's looking for, uh, in, in this book, a kind of verisimilitude, a documentary sharpness, absolutely um, learning from photography. I think he may also be thinking about the role of the journalist historian, right? And I notice in, in looking at these poems 
And again, they're just their spaciousness and the, you know, the way they have their own discrete little pages, uh, as they often don't uh, in other editions, allows one to see how many times he'll say year, year of this, year of that, as though, uh, as though quotidian time were being um, distilled down and the nation was discovering itself in particular moments, right? 1861, America forever after, thereafter, will be different for what that year will mean to us. And we, of course, right now, this month, this week, are marking, right? It's, it's the end of April, it's 150 years since the end of the Civil War, and uh, I think Whitman, uh, as a practitioner of the quotidian during the war and in this book, Drum Taps, is thinking about a journal, a, a reporter's, a reportorial, reportorial practice that, um, uh, that, that can, um, that can, that can offer um, history of, of consequence. And some of the screaming quality, you know, you, if one thinks of the screaming headlines that you see, you know, casualty list released from Donaldson, or the, the, the journalism itself in the period is looking for the kind of effective register. How much can you shout after all? So it shouts big and it shouts a little bit, a, a little bit smaller, and one sees Whitman trying to use um, some of those, uh, some of those uh, tools. And finally, I, I said I would only speak for a few minutes. I guess I uh, failed at that. We um, all did. Yeah, we all did. Um, got, got excited. Um, and I, I think this has, in some ways, already been said. Uh, but I, but I will, um, I will, I will say it again. This is a book where Whitman is thinking so self-consciously and so. Um, exp and offering so much explicit commentary on the kind of poet he wants to become. He doesn't want to be a poetling. He doesn't want to be a poet. Um, he's warning those, uh, as we heard, that you know those denizens of the library, those gentlemen, um, those gentlemen critics. He's warning them that. Um, and he's warning himself, and he takes himself to task again and again. What kind of poet uh, will be adequate to this moment? And of course, the great statement of that is just that sentence, you know, that, that not sentence, that beautiful line in When Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed, what shall I hang on the chamber walls? What shall I hang? That, that, um, that act of turning uh, of turning witness and sensation and recollection into form uh, requires and exacts of us so much deliberation. Uh, and finally, to thank Larry, uh, I noticed in reading the, uh, your acknowledgments that this was a, in some way, a collective project. You edited it, but you edited it with your students, many of them, I, I gather, contributed to the footnotes, and that, um, and as a collective project of reintroducing a major text to, uh, to a new generation of readers, it really resonated with me, since, as you'll see in a minute, I, um, that is, uh, that is a longer term project of mine, what, it, what you're all about to see is a sneak preview of part five of Poetry in America, the online course. Uh, part five is the Civil War and its aftermath, and it launches March 8th. And it's, uh, it's three and a half weeks long, and its first two weeks are really built around drum taps and Melville's battle pieces. Uh, I bring in this, uh, uh, in, in this module, whatever a module is and whatever a week is in an online course, it's still a mystery to me. Um, but uh, what I try to do here is to bring major works like 
uh, like drum taps and, mm -hmm. um, and battle pieces into conversation with other forms of expression uh, and, um, uh, and, and, and other kinds of, of rhetoric. And I think that um, Henry James said that, you know, Whitman was a prose writer um, trying to lift himself through muscular effort. And I agree with the muscularity, actually, of this uh, book into to make himself a poet. Certainly the line between, the boundary between prose and poetry uh, becomes so interesting, so vexed, so uh, richly problematic in this period. Prose writers are always regretting their lack of uh, looking to the poets um, for, um, for language adequate to, uh, to the experience, <clears throat> and yet the facts of the war um, are also documentary. And so that was a, a long-winded way of saying that uh, it, for the first time in this long online course <clears throat> I'm doing, <clears throat> prose, the relationship between prose and poetry um, is, is coming to the fore. What you are about to see, um, and probably I'll skip my remarks afterwards, except here, I'll, I'll do them now. What, what you're about to see um, are four separate um, pieces of video that, that uh, we've, we've spliced together into a, little, into a little montage. In the first of them, uh, you'll hear Devon Tynes, who uh, performed here, I guess, in the last uh, uh, in, the, in the last episode um, of this series, and then a conversation with Drew Faust and a group of um, uh, and a group of students and colleagues uh, in Woodbury Library, where we talk about 1861, Vigil Strange, and Cavalry Crossing a Ford, uh, and then uh, you'll see a little segment we taped at the Shaw. Monument down on Boston Common. Mm -hmm. We taped it. I'm, we won't say this in the video, but I just a personal note since you shared your juvenilia. Um, we taped it just a few hours before the Boston Marathon bombing. Uh, I took the students actually. We, we went to the monument. We talked about violence. And then we stood on Beacon Street until the police told us to go um, home. And so this taping makes me uh, makes me uh, almost almost cry and then and then the last of these uh, you'll see the Dean of uh, Harvard Law School Martha Minow discussing uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr's Memorial Day one of his Memorial Day um, addresses and so uh, only one only one more word before I run it and then I won't say anything after and that is um, What's really very remarkable for me and what I'm very curious about is how the rest of the world, who in the rest of the world will be watching this and how they will be receiving it. This civil war will be experienced by people in countries having civil wars. <laughs> um, we have students in the Ukraine, we have students in Congo, I have students in Syria, and, um, and I do see the, uh, the, the demographics of my course change um, depending on what the material is. But um, for me, it's a, uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful privilege, I'm still sort of getting my head around, to have the opportunity to introduce poems like um, like the, the verses from Drum Taps to a, to a global audience. So this is just a part of what will launch on March, on May 8th. Did my Lord Why not every man in my 
Hall in 1861 is a man walking across, the, it's many men walking across the continent, spread out all, all over this geography. Several of you use the word embody, to put time in bodies. And this is, in my view, part of Whitman's democratic project. This is 1861 is the people here, isn't it? It's turning it over to what I think he celebrates in so many of his, his poems, the, the mass, the common people who are men who will be fighting this war. And so it's, he sort of gives the year over to that. And, and oh, it's Sanders. That's right, to the yeah. working man, yeah. and out of, right, instead of the American, uh, instead of the poet link in his study representing uh, that democratic body, it's instead yes. who the war will be fought by and for. What else do we do in war to organize ourselves as well as like march to the beat of a drum and give up our random occupations? What else do people do when they enter war? They yeah, they put on they put on uniforms. What do the what do the uniforms say? Exactly, they have that, that elevation above normal, the normal, um, what I'm calling the randomness of life, and they, that elevation they enjoy is also the elevation of the state, right? What Whitman does here is draw our attention uh, in these poems to one of these functions of war, which is to organize, to aestheticize, and to allow us to see ourselves as part of one thing. If you wait in line, suppose on Tremont Street Mall, ordered simply to wait and do nothing, and have watched the enemy bring their guns to bear upon you down a gentle slope like that of Beacon Street, have seen the puff of the firing, have felt the burst of the spherical case shot as it came toward you, have heard and seen the shrieking fragments go tearing through your company and have known that the next or the next shot carries your fate. Maybe we should pause there. Sure. So what strikes me is the concreteness and vividness of these uh, phrases. It's as if he's still living in the moment uh, and certainly able to convey it to all of us in all of the senses, uh, smell, sound, sight, terror. Uh, and uh, it is often said about the one who comes to Whitman that his experience of the war was the defining experience of his life with this double dimension of having a sense of purpose and heroism, her and also a sense of the really cruelty and destruction That's all. <laughs>It's very nice, you get to uh, improvise on the spot. I'm gonna synthesize uh, some of the remarks um, that my colleagues made in talking about this music, uh, rather than um, sticking to my prepared script. So, uh, a lot was said about come up from the field's father. And one of the pieces on the concert portion of the program is a setting of that poem by Court Vile joined with a setting of one of the more uh, jingoistic, tub-thumping poems in uh, uh, drum taps, Beat, Beat, Drums. Uh, Vial in the 1940s wrote four Walt Whitman settings, and they, uh, it's a, got a complicated uh, story attached to it, which there really isn't time to tell. 
But basically, what Weil was uh, responding to was that very arc that all three of us talked about in, in Whitman's uh, poem, the documentation of a movement from martial fervor to uh, grief and compassion and all of the world of meanings that that movement elicits and provokes. So you will hear um, in Beat Beat Drums, which is the, the first piece on the program, uh, Weil uh, actually creating um, the, the cacophony um, of drum taps as a kind of fusillade. It's an extraordinarily uh, violent uh, song uh, imbued with a uh, vein of triumphalism which is deliberately exaggerated and hard to believe. And everything that follows in the su subsequent songs is a kind of retraction of that initial fervor. Come Up From the Fields is particularly interesting because of one thing that it does. And you, what you're going to hear in the middle um, of uh, Come Up From the Fields, uh, but when the uh, state of mind of the suffering mother is described, is an extraordinary eruption of musical violence. And this musical violence is not just any musical violence. It is very, very particularized. It takes the form uh, of uh, the singers being accompanied by pounding triplets on the piano, you know, three note rhythmic groupings. And the uh, sound of these triplets is an unmistakable and very uh, striking allusion to a very, very famous German song, Earl Koenig by Schubert. Uh, Hunter, could you give us the sound of that? Yep. And this, this particular motive, uh, suitably transformed, but again, unmistakably recognizable in, uh, in, the, in the song, becomes this uh, kind of overpowering expression of futility, hopelessness, grieving, emotional uh, turmoil. The very thing that, that Lisa was talking about, this kind of explosion of affect that you find in the Drum Taps poems. I mean, Weil is very much tuned into that. And I think that it's particularly important that the, the people involved with this song, it, uh, one of the iconic great traditional figures of German music, Franz Schubert, and the all-time iconic figure of German literature and culture, Goethe, whose poem it is that Schubert is setting. These things are transposed into the American context. And this has a double significance in the 1940s. On the one hand, it reflects Weil's very, very strenuous embrace of his own American identity. He became a citizen. He became very patriotic. He wanted to make sure that people knew that he wasn't really a transplanted European. He was one who had transformed himself into an American. And it's very significant, I think, that it's Walt Whitman's voice above all through which Weil sought to make that clear. The other point, of course, is that uh, we are transposing German culture into an American framework and transposing it in a way which redeems its significance, the very significance that the Nazis had rendered unthinkable and monstrous in the, these years. So that Whitman becomes a, a, a vehicle of liberation, of transformation, of redemption in this music. So uh, you'll be able to hear that, I think, very straightforwardly. Um, the other pieces in the program, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was give you a chance to hear different musical approaches to the same text. And again, it's very uh, happy that we actually got to talk about this text a little bit, Look Down, Fair Moon. You will hear three different settings of Look Down, Fair Moon, one by a, a tragically short-lived American composer named Charles Nijinsky, died in 1940 um, at the age of 31, Schubert's age, ironically. Um, and uh, then one by the eminent American composer Ned Roram, and then one by me. And I think I, I don't want to elaborate on these except to say that you will find that they are all remarkably different from one another. Uh, although they each, I think, I'm hoping for my own, uh, you know, find something in, in this poem which is uh, present to a reading, particularly a reading aloud. I very much agree with what Larry Buell was saying about the, the uh, musicality of that poem. It's, it's transformation from the page to utterance. And then finally, just to pick up one more thread, um, the 
reference to PTSD. Uh, my songs at the end of the program, under the title Nimbus, consist of a setting um, of the poem, uh, which in the original drum taps is In Clouds Descending, In Midnight Sleep. And in the form in which I set it, which was its 1871 version, just In Midnight Sleep, is also a poem about PTSD, the speaker's involuntary experience of traumatic flashbacks to the war. It's one of the poems that Whitman took out of drum taps, and I really don't think he should. He gave it the utterly awful title of Old War Dreams and stuck it off somewhere where no one would notice it. But it's psychologically and formally very acute. And uh, it shares with Look Down Fair Moon a, an, an image, the image of the dead on their backs with extended arms. So the, that sharing of that image struck me as a, a way of connecting the two poems, which I was seeking then also to connect musically. And the image uh, at another dimension uh, also reaches out into the photographic archive. Whitman's experience of battlefields was very limited. He did not often get out literally to the field where the kind of sights that he describes in uh, in Midnight Sleep would have been seen. But he could and almost certainly did see photographs of them. And in particular, again, in Alexander Gardner's Washington studio. So there are, are two images uh, that I'd just like to call your attention to, and then I'll get out of the way and let uh, our musicians uh, do the more important work of actually bringing you the music. But if we could have uh, the dead on their backs um, on, the, uh, on the screen, the one uh, from Antietam. And then even more graphically, perhaps, the one from Gettysburg. This is a very famous image. And this image is what women is projecting in the poem. And in particular, the unforgettableness of the image, the indelibleness of the image, the fact that it has penetrated the psyche of the speaker. And he cannot help reliving it again and again and again. And then uh, the uh, other uh, thing that he recalls is uh, being on a burial detail. This is something Whitman never did. He talks about um, how the burial details gathered the heaps. And indeed, in uh, many instances of Civil War battles, uh, soldiers uh, were shoveled into mass graves. And uh, the uh, process of kind of cleaning up the battlefield was a sort of sanitary operation, had very little ceremony attached to it. Uh, and so the image uh, here, the one called Gathering the Heaps. Gather the Heaps. This is also from Antietam. Up a little bit. There you go. Just trenches full of dead bodies. It's certainly easy to understand. Um, how even the sight of this in a photograph could render uh, a, an indelible memory strong enough to recur in one's dreams. And Whitman saw enough real misery, bloodshed, um, and suffering uh, to suggest that this poem, which is an imaginative uh, reconstruction and a highly formalized one, that, that notion again of taking suffering and transforming it to form, of moving from the documentary to the symbolic. It's very much a part of what is going on in, in this poem. So um, if I may just uh, beg your indulgence for one uh, moment, I have to go down there and do something to something that's going to help record the concert, and then we can get started. All set.
distresses the shake our dead while they lie awaiting us. So strong you thump of terrible drums. So loud you hear. from the fields, Father, here's a letter from our Pete, and come to the door, Father, here's a letter from my dear son. Lord, his father, know where the trees differ green, yellower and redder, cool and sweeter. transparent after the rain and with wondrous clouds below to all come all vital and beautiful and the farm prospers the mother 
hands on faces ghastly, swollen, purple. On our deck, on their backs, with their arms tossed. of scenes of nature Shining sweetly, shining. 
But now of their bones at night, I dream, I dream, I dream, but now of their bones at night. 